Do you like sand? Do you like worms? Do you enjoy the idea of being able to consume human waste? <sighs> if you answered yes to these three questions, then you're probably a fan of Dune. First published in the 1960s, Dune is an epic science fiction novel written by this man, Frank Herbert, who much like you had a keen interest in anything that involved sand, worms and drinking your own piss. <sighs> Herbert would go on to write five sequels of Dune, each one more abstract than the last, and the franchise would ultimately go on to become one of the best-selling sci-fi series of all time. The story of Dune follows Paul Atreides and his family. His father Duke Leto Atreides is the mighty ruler of the ocean world Caladan, and his mother Jessica is a member of the Bene Gesserit, a group of super-powered telepathic women who control and steer politics from the shadows. Paul's father is given a mission by the Emperor of the Known Universe, where he and his family must travel to the harsh desert planet of Arrakis, also known as Dune, where they must take over control of the spice harvesting duties from the previous occupiers who are known as the Harkonnens. Spice is a hallucinogen that appears only on Arrakis, and it is what allows humans to navigate long distances in space. After arriving on Arrakis, the Atreides family soon discover that they have been led into a trap. The Emperor is in fact a jealous man who perceives the Atreides family and their growing power as a threat, so he devises a plan along with the Harkonnens to lure the Atreides to Arrakis so that they can be destroyed. Oh yeah, and there's also the Fremen who are the native dwelling humans on Arrakis and they don't like it when people harvest their nice spice because it's theirs and they'll destroy anyone who tries to take it. Oh yeah, and Paul's mother Jessica and her Bene Gesserit pals told everyone on Arrakis that Paul is the Messiah and Paul being the crazed lunatic that he is just goes along with it. Oh yeah, and there's also giant worms. Don't forget about the giant worms. How could we forget about the giant worms? There's a lot to the story of Dune and I've barely scratched the surface. A few filmmakers have attempted to adapt the story for the big screen throughout the years. David Lynch did it in the 80s, John Harrison tried it with a TV series in the early 2000s, and most recently, probably the most successful attempt of a film adaptation was done by Denis Villeneuve, where he divided the first book into two movies and made hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office. So as you can see, Dune is a wildly popular franchise, and with every great franchise comes a sometimes enjoyable, but more often than not, a sometimes terrible game. And that's why today we'll be playing this squirming pile of worm vomit. Frank Herbert's Dune released in 2001, coinciding with John Harrison's TV adaptation. The game was developed by Cryo Interactive active for PC, but Europe also got a PlayStation 2 version, which is the one we will be playing through today. The game turned out to be a very expensive flop, and shortly after its release, Cryo Interactive unfortunately went bankrupt, and their game developing days were over. The game has you playing as the Holy Messiah himself, Paul Atreides. The story begins shortly after the Emperor and the Harkonnens initiate their plan to annihilate Paul and his family. Paul's father dies, but Paul and his mother escape into the desert, where they aim to find and lead the Fremen tribe, to help them destroy the Harkonnens and reclaim their planet, where Paul can fulfill his destiny as a self-proclaimed Fremen messiah. Upon starting Frank Herbert's Dune, I am met with what can only be described as really good music. I'm surprised by this, and as I listen, I can't help but feel that I'm about to embark on the grandest adventure of the most epic proportions. How wrong I was. This wide-shouldered polygon is Paul Atreides, and this is where we begin our thrilling adventure, the Atreides Training Room. It's nothing more than a tutorial level where we learn all about the basics of gameplay. Left analog stick to move. Who would have guessed it? In order for us to climb over obstacles, we walk towards them, and in order for us to climb down, we walk towards them. How engaging. In the bottom left corner we have our health bar in green and our distiller in blue. The distiller is built into Paul's armor and it is the device that converts bodily fluids into drinking water. In the game it's a healing item and by pressing triangle on the controller we can exchange water for health. We also learn about this really cool wall mechanic where we can peek round corners to check for enemies. If we press square on the controller we do a silky smooth G.I. Joe roll over to the next wall, all the while remaining completely undetected. You might be thinking to yourself, hey, Maybe there's some cool sneaky stealth elements in the game, but you would be wrong. There is a kind of assassination mechanic called neutralize, but there's no real stealth involved. Paul just stomps his way over loud as can be like a big stompy chungus, and as long as you are close to the guard, you can press X on the controller to neutralize, killing them in one hit with Paul's Chris knife. A successful neutralization of an enemy also refills your distiller, which is a nice touch. We then pull a lever which opens this door, and then we gain access to the laser weapon, and by pressing L1 on the controller, we can now scroll through all of our available weapons. This also shows the amount of ammo we currently hold. Now we can peek around corners and blast the living daylights out of people. As well as being able to refill our distiller after a successful neutralized takedown, we can also find distiller refill pickups laying around within the levels. Next we learn about one of the most annoying gameplay elements, having to memorize codes. This comes up quite a few times in the game, but lucky for me it's 2024 and I can just take a picture on my iPhone.
So we memorize the code, input the code into this machine, open the door, kill this guy, kill this guy, pick up this magnetic key pass, use it to open the door, the game freezes for 10 seconds, and that's the tutorial complete. We are now fully equipped with the knowledge that we need to play the game. Let the epic adventure begin! We are now introduced to a cutscene which sets the premise of the game and lets us know at which point in the story we are currently at. As mentioned before, Paul's father has been killed by the Harkonnens and Paul and his mother Jessica have fled into the desert in search of the Fremen tribe and through them Paul hopes to regain his power and avenge his family. We are then introduced to the first dialogue scene in the game and I'm beginning to think that this game seems to run a little slow. A loading screen? Really? The voice dialogue in Dune really does ruin the immersive experience. It's not so much the voice acting that's bad but the very long awkward silence between each of the character's lines. Here's what I mean. Mother, don't untie your distiller. It will recycle your body's own water much more effectively. It's all we have. I can see Fremen settlements. Can you smell something strange? I'm not sure why this is, but it makes the dialogue feel awkward and unnatural, as if everything that everyone says takes a ridiculous amount of time to process inside their tiny NPC brains. According to Paul, the something strange that Jessica can smell is in fact a stinky sandworm. So Paul comes up with the brilliant idea of looking for the thumper so that they can distract the stinky sandworm and move on unnoticed. So here we are in the desert, and there now appears to be a random flashing logo on the screen. No explanation as to what this might be, and even now after finishing the game, I still have no idea what it is. Maybe it's just there to be annoying. We collect the required thumper and stick it firmly into the ground so that it will attract the worm. When navigating the desert, we have to try and make sure that we try and stick to the light colored sand because if we step into the dark colored sand, then we end up up to our waist in class A hallucinogenics and it takes a stupidly long time to get out. Once we make it across, it appears the thumper didn't really work because out of the sand emerges the big floppy ding dong worm himself who'd like nothing more than to flop his big giant stupid worm head all over the place until it flattens us. This is the part where we run, and although we're supposed to try and avoid the darker areas of the sand, it's actually not possible. We have to cross the sinking areas at certain points, and because there's no clear path for us to follow, we just have to hope that we're not slowed down for too long, or else we're just going to get flopped on just like this. After many attempts, I finally work out through trial and error that keeping to the left area of the screen seems to get me the furthest, and after about 10 more attempts and what appears to be sheer luck, I make it to the end and we finally say goodbye to our odorous, wormy friend. The following cutscene introduces us to the leader of the Harkonnens, the extremely unhealthy looking but surprisingly floaty Baron. We also get to meet his nephew, Raban, who looks like he permanently has his face firmly pressed up against the window. With the Harkonnens now under the impression that the Atreides family has been destroyed, the Baron gives Raban the task of retaking the planet of Arrakis by destroying the Fremen and taking their lovely spice. <laughs> of course. Next we find ourselves at the Siege the Fremen hideout that will act as a sort of hub area between missions. Time seems to have also progressed quite a bit because Paul's mother Jessica has in fact given birth to this horrific excuse for a character design. Speaking of horrific character design, this is Steelgar, the leader of the Fremen, and him and Paul seem to be all buddy-buddy now that Paul's been staying here for a while. Together they come up with a plan to destroy a Harkonnen spice harvester, but before that we have to collect some equipment. Oh look, there's a nice NPC for us to talk to. I wonder if they have any useful information. Is that a loading screen? for a random NPC? Whatever he has to say must be important. Cool, hard. That's tasty. Excuse me, what's tasty? Can you elaborate? I waited 10 seconds for 3 seconds of useless information, and the feeling of never knowing what is tasty will eat away at me forever. Oh look, it's my little sister. How are you today? Lovely weather we're having. Remember, I was in Mother's womb when she drank the water. I share all the knowledge of the succession of Fremen Bene Gesserit mothers. Hers included, Big Brother. Given the scope of what I know, I could easily call you Little Brother. Okay, that's nice. Now have a nice day. After running around for a while, we come across this guy who gives us an SOS jammer, which we need for the mission. Then we find Shani, who gives us the Chris knife made from the tooth of a stinky sandworm. We thank Shani, and then we notify Steelgar that we're ready to begin the mission. Okay, so here we are back in the desert. Let's go blow up this harvester. Remember, no stealth needed. We can just barrel towards our enemies without them noticing. Oh, we also have a projectile pistol. That's useful. Gun combat sure does feel clumsy and not at all fun. After eventually shooting everyone, we find an ammo refill and make our way up this nice inviting ladder. Once we're up, we place this SOS jammer where it tells us to, and this timer appears, but for some reason it isn't moving yet, and I can't help but feel on edge. We make our way round and enter the harvester, and the countdown begins. We've got 10 minutes to do. 
something. We run through, guns blazing, pull a lever which opens a door, run through the door where we find out we have to pull six more levers. This opens another door and inside the room it appears we need a code. After running around aimlessly for a while, I finally find the code on this screen. I take a quick screenshot, head back, put the code in and would you believe it, it opens another door. Once I go through the door, we get a nice still image of Paul happily running away from an explosion. I guess actually animating this and putting it into the game was too much for the developers. I mean, why even bother? It's not like people should enjoy something that they paid money for. But the desert is teeming with Fremen. Oh dear, it appears Raban isn't too happy about losing his harvester. At this point, we are also introduced to this guy, who I think is a smuggler, I'm not sure. All I know is that we fight this dweeb later on. Hmm, who's this old geezer keeping warm next to the nuclear reactor? Does he think he's in his winter cottage next to the cozy fire? We should warn him of the danger. We don't want him getting radiation poisoning. Let's hurry while simultaneously murdering everyone in our way. Excuse me, sir, do you know the danger of not taking proper precautions whilst you're around nuclear equipment? Oh, he doesn't seem to mind. Oh well, don't say I didn't warn you. Oh no. Oh, we've spooked him. Quick, let's escape while simultaneously murdering everyone in our way. Maybe I can steal this ship. Excuse me, coming through, don't mind me, thank you. Thanks for the ship, bye. Well, Shani seems thoroughly impressed with our heroics. How horrifically romantic. The next level switches things up. This time we have to sneak aboard a vessel disguised as a Harkonnen soldier. The downside to this is we now no longer have our distiller, so healing is not possible, but that doesn't really matter because everyone thinks we're a bad guy anyway. We even made a new friend who was helpful enough to tell us that we need a key card for this door. Thanks for being so helpful, here's a knife in the back as a reward. After running around a bit, assassinating a few people out of boredom, and dodging some lasers in the clumsiest way possible, we get to our first boss fight, a scary laser beam that shoots us if we go near it. After running round and round in a circle, we finally defeat the scary laser beam after about 30 shots. Afterwards, we encounter the alien version of Stephen Hawking. Fine, we shall honor our part. You did the right thing coming to see us so promptly. We are being inundated with requests for orbital satellites. And after not understanding a single word he says, we leave, naturally. Oh no, our romantic interest Shani has been captured, and it's up to us to save her. Oh, it's the dweeb from before. I guess it's time for the man with the messiah complex to show everyone what he's made of. After a quick stab with our Chris knife, we disable his shield. Then we shoot him in his stupid face 20 times before he goes down. He also drops this super powerful gun that I'm sure he won't mind us taking now that he's dead. After rescuing Shani, we run for the hills, dodging bullets as we go and we manage to escape unscathed. Next we come to probably the most annoying thing in a game that I have ever experienced in my life. Paul wakes up in the seats to find that a hunter killer is there to kill him. The detection on this thing is super sensitive, and the slightest increase in movement speed equals a one-hit kill for poor old Paul Atreides. The aim is to very slowly make our way to the other side of the room so that Paul can grab his gun, but every time we move, no matter how slow, it can sometimes still be triggered. But if we're lucky or stop quick enough, I can't tell which one, it doesn't do anything. I suppose it's like a deadly version of musical statues except it's even more boring and annoying. After 30 minutes of dying repeatedly, we very slowly edge our way across the room, and I mean very slowly. Eventually, we just about stay awake, grab the gun, and destroy the hunter killer. Turns out the culprit behind this bad choice in game design was this guy, who also happens to be a face changer. Oh my god, it's me! I start this section out with 62 ammo, and all we have to do is just run after him while shooting an insane amount of lasers. Once I'm down to 15, ammo, he finally goes down, and will be remembered as one of the spongiest enemies in a video game ever. Next, it's time to pay Raban a visit and end things once and for all. I will drink your blood while savouring your agony. I have an idea. Let's just shoot at one another until someone falls over. I wouldn't stand next to that poorly constructed statue of yourself if I were you, Raban. All it took was one shot, it really was poorly constructed, a bit like the game itself. I did warn you, Raban, but you just didn't listen, did you? And now you're dead, aren't you? Silly Raban. And that's that, the game ends with Paul Atreides awkwardly riding off into the sunset, on top of a big, stinky, floppy, disgusting, horrible, nasty sandworm, and the credits roll. So there you have it. The only entertainment value that this game holds is the fact that it is so horribly bad that it makes it funny. I'm sure if Frank Herbert were alive today, he would rather drink his own piss than allow this version of his work to be released to the public. If I were to rate this game, I would probably give it two stinky wormholes. That seems like a fair rating. As always, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed, I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.